Angida comes from the Latin angier, which means to strangle, and pectoris comes from pectus, meaning chest. So angina pectoris loosely translates to strangling of the chest. Which actually makes a lot of sense because angina pectoris is caused by reduced blood flow, which causes ischemia to the heart muscle, or a lack of oxygen to the heart. Almost like the heart's being strangled, which causes terrible chest pain. Stable angina, or chronic angina, is the most common type of angina, and it usually happens when the patient has greater than or equal to 70% stenosis, meaning 70% of the artery is blocked by plaque buildup. This small opening that blood flows through might be enough to supply the heart during rest, but if the body demands more blood and oxygen, like during exercise or stressful situations, the heart has to work harder and therefore needs more blood and oxygen itself. It's during these times of exertion or emotional stress that people with stable angina have chest pain, since the blood flow isn't meeting the metabolic demands of the heart muscle or myocardium. But the pain usually goes away with rest. In the majority of cases, the underlying cause of stable angina is atherosclerosis of one or more of the coronary arteries, the arteries supplying blood to the heart muscles. Other heart conditions that might lead to stable angina are ones that cause a thickened heart muscle wall, which would require more oxygen. This increase in muscle size can be due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from a genetic cause, or as a result from the heart having to pump against higher pressures, as is the case in aortic stenosis, which is a narrowing of the aortic valve, or hypertension. These larger, thicker heart muscles require more oxygen, and if the patients can't meet the increasing demands, they feel pain in the form of angina. Whatever the case, the heart needs blood, and if we look at the heart wall, there's three layers, the outermost layer, the epicardium, then the myocardium in the middle, and then the endocardium inside the heart. The coronary arteries start up in the epicardium, and then dive down and supply all the heart tissue. If blood flow is reduced or the myocardium is thicker, Blood has a harder time reaching the deeper layer just under the endocardium, called the subendocardium. Therefore, the classic finding with angina is subendocardial ischemia, meaning less oxygen is reaching the region just under the endocardium. This ischemia is thought to trigger the release of adenosine, bradykinin, and other molecules that stimulate nerve fibers in the myocardium that result in the sensation of pain. That chest pain is usually described as feeling like pressure or squeezing, and it can radiate to the left arm, jaw, shoulder, and back, and sometimes is accompanied by shortness of breath and diaphoresis, or sweating. Usually the pain and symptoms last less than 20 minutes and subside after the exertion or stress is taken away, and therefore the heart muscle isn't demanding as much blood. Now, unlike stable angina, which describes when patients have pain only during periods of exertion or stress, but not during rest, there's also unstable angina, which is when patients have pain during exercise or stress, as well as during rest. It never really goes away. Unstable angina is usually caused by rupture of atherosclerotic plaque with thrombosis, meaning a blood clot forms on top of a mound of plaque. Although the occlusion might not block the entire vessel, there's now even less room for blood to flow by, and the heart tissue is starting to feel starved for oxygen, even while pumping at a normal rate. Unstable angina, for the same reason as stable angina, involves subendocardial ischemia, and it should be treated as an emergency because patients are at a high risk of progressing to myocardial infarction, or heart attack. The key distinction is that unstable angina means that the heart tissue is alive, but ischemic, or starving for oxygen, whereas myocardial infarction means that the areas of the heart tissue have already begun to necrose, or die. Now, a third type of angina is vasospastic angina, also known as prinzmetal angina, and patients may or may not also have atherosclerosis. Ischemia and resulting chest pain is due to coronary artery vasospasms, meaning the smooth muscles around the arteries constrict extremely tightly and reduce blood flow enough to cause ischemia. Episodes of vasospastic angina don't correlate with exertion and can happen any time, including at rest. The underlying mechanism causing vasospasms isn't well understood, but likely involves vasoconstrictors like platelet thromboxane A2. Unlike both stable and unstable angina, in this case the coronary arteries constricted so severely that all layers of the heart wall being supplied are affected. Therefore, it's referred to as transmural ischemia. Alright, so if we line these three up side to side, there are some important clinical similarities and differences. First, it's super important to remember that in each case, the injury to cardiomyocytes isn't permanent, meaning it's reversible and the cardiomyocytes don't die, which is how this differs from myocardial infarction. On an electrocardiogram, or ECG, 
Both stable and unstable angina show an ST segment depression, since ischemia is limited to the subendocardium. In contrast, vasospastic angina shows ST segment elevation due to transmural ischemia. Rest tends to relieve stable angina, whereas unstable angina and vasospastic angina can happen anytime, including at rest. In terms of medications, all three can be treated with nitroglycerin, which is a vasodilator that increases blood vessel diameter to allow more blood flow. In addition, vasospastic angina also responds to calcium channel blockers. Alright, as a quick recap. Angina pectoris is chest pain caused by reduced blood flow resulting in a lack of oxygen in the heart muscle. There are three types, stable angina, unstable angina, and vasospastic angina. Rest tends to relieve stable angina, but not the other two types, and all three can be treated with nitroglycerin.